So uh, let's uh, start the scientific uh, talk today. So it's uh, our great honor and pleasure to have uh, Sir John Bo here today to give us the first talk with the title Generalized Hadamard Jump Condition and Polycrystal Microstructure. Professor John Bo is professor of mathematics at the Harvard University in Edinburgh, from 96 to 2018, he was a Sutherland Professor of Natural Philosophy at the Mathematical Institute, University of Oxford. He is an emeritus professor in Oxford and an emeritus fellow of the Queen's College. He is a foreign member of the. French Academy of Sciences, a fellow of Royal Society UK, and a member of Academia Europea. May I now invite Sir John Bo to the stage? Professor Bo, please. So, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this, actually it's the second 80th birthday meeting uh, for my friend Philippe, which I have uh, spoken. Um, uh, so, I really, I, I've known Philippe before his Hong Kong days, of course, and uh, I really have profound admiration for what he has, the work he has done in elasticity and in applied mathematics generally, and for his wonderful pedagogical skills, but also because he sets an example to us that uh, after others may think that you have passed your sell-by date, you can continue to do great research. And of course, it's to the credit of CityU that that's been possible. So um, I slightly changed, when I realized that this was not just a mathematical audience, um, I slightly changed my title to, um, I, broad I broadened it a bit. And uh, although it does, does contain um, uh, technical mathematics, uh, um, I, try, I try to describe some, some recent experiments as well, uh, which, which I've not done myself, of course, because I'm not an experimentalist, but which I've been connected with. So um, if, you, if you don't understand the technical mathematics, and I must say that when I go to maths talks, I very rarely understand the technical mathematics myself. I uh, hope that you'll be able to let that wash over you and um, and um, just concentrate on some of the pictures I'm going to show. So this is joint work with Carsten Carstensen, uh, in which I've been engaged for many years. He, he's from, uh, um, sorry, from, um, this is a new Chinese pointer I've got. So it's got, got a fantastically bright green spot, which I, which, which I, which I really like. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, um, rank one matrices and the Hadamard jump condition. So what is this? So this is the simplest, uh, there's, a kind of, there's a kind of feedback from the microphone maybe. Okay, so um, this is the simplest uh, situation where, where this operates. So you have a, a map Y taking Rn to Rm, which is piecewise affine. So it's a continuous map. And piecewise affine means that its gradient jumps across the plane. So uh, the gradient above the plane is, say, A, uh, so the plane is x dot n equals k, and it has normal n. And so above the plane, the gradient is A, and below the plane, it is B. Now, now of course, since this is a map from Rn to Rm, the gradient is an n by n matrix. Okay, so the A and B are uh, matrices, and so the question is, how are they related? So you can easily work that out. You let C be A minus B, and then you, you equate the tangential derivatives on either side. So you have that Cx is 0 if x is perpendicular to n. So the, the typical form of a, a vector that's perpendicular to n is you take any vector z, and you, you subtract off z dot n times n. And so you have that C of this is 0. And then you see that Cz is Cn tensor nz. So this is the tensor product of two vectors, which is defined like this. And so therefore you find this Hadamard jump condition that C, which is A minus B, is a vector 
tensor producted with the normal to the plane. And of course, you can get this, this vector is in fact a minus b acting on n. OK. And um, that's the general form of a matrix of rank 1 if a is different from, from b. Now, more generally, this holds for y being piecewise c1 with the gradient jumping across a, a C1 surface, or a smooth surface, and here's a point A at which the normal is N, and then the limit of the, of the gradient of Y from above at A is A, and the, the limit from below is B, and then you, again you get that A minus B is uh, B tensor N, and you can, you can prove that by reducing it to the previous situation by, by blowing up around the, point, um, or by, around the point A, you should say, uh, using this formula. And then, then in the limit as delta goes to zero, you get to the situation where you have a, a piecewise affine map uh, uh, across a plane with normal n. OK, now th this jump condition is very important for understanding what are known as Martensitic uh, phase transformations. These are solid phase transformations of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an alloy, typically. Uh, in which the, um, the shape of the underlying crystal lattice changes at some uh, uh, critical temperature. So, for example, it could be cubic to tetragonal, so there's a critical temperature theta critical, above which the, um, the material wants to be in a cubic phase, so you've got a regular lattice of uh, uh, a regular cubic lattice that high temperature phase is typically called austenite. So there might, it might be, say, face-centered cubic. So there might be an atom at each corner of the cube and one in the middle of each face. And then as you reduce the temperature below theta critical, the, 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 the lattice wants to change shape. It's a first-order transformation, so it does it suddenly like this. And so, so this is, in the, in the case of cubic to tetragonal, what happens is that it changes shape from the, the basic cell, changes shape from a cube to a tetragon. That's a, 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 a brick-like object with two sides equal and one side different. And because the whole situation has cubic symmetry, if it wants to extend in this direction, it also equally would want to stand, extend in the two other cubic directions. So that way you get three so-called tetragonal variants of the low temperature phase, which is called martensite. So there are many different possible um, changes of Symmetry, uh, for example, cubic to orthorhombic, that takes place in copper, aluminum, nickel. I'll show you some pictures of copper, aluminum, nickel. Now, uh, in, in this case, the change of shape is that you, first of all, choose one of the cubic directions and extend in, in that direction. And then you, you take the two uh, perpendicular face normals and ex extend by different amounts in those two uh, directions. So you have three choices of the, of the cubic direction, and then you can swap these two directions. That way you get three times two, which is six, variants of the orthorhombic phase. Well, here's a picture, a high-resolution electron micrograph of, of a cubic tetragonal transformation in nickel manganese. And this is, this is in, in the low temperature phase, uh, and you see a microstructure of, of, of martensite. So in the high temperature phase, this would just have been a regular lattice. So each, each dot here represents a column of atoms perpendicular to the screen. And you see, just, you just look at it, you see that there's a kind of piecewise affine deformation uh, in which the gradient jumps across various interfaces. And these layers are alternately about 10 or 6 atomic spacings uh, thick. And if you look very carefully at the dots, I've sort of drawn it here so it's easier to see. So the cubic axes are at 45 degrees to the screen and into the screen. And now you see that on, on one side of one of these interfaces, this is face-centered cubic, and so it's, this, is, this is one of the tetragonal variants in which there's been an extension in this direction. And, um, and on the other side, it's, a, it's a, another variant in which the extension has been in this direction. And this, this Interface is chosen somehow, we'll see in a bit mathematically why, how, uh, to somehow minimize the, to, to make these uh, two variants geometrically compatible somehow. Okay. So now, how do you model this? Well, you can, down to quite small length scales, you can use elasticity theory. So here's the energy 
typical setup of an energy minimization problem in elasticity. So you have a reference configuration uh, in which the um, uh, crystal occupies some region omega in R3, and you, you use that reference configuration to label the points. So then you deform it, and in a, in a, in a, in a, in a deformed configuration, this point x goes to y of x. Okay, so, uh, so then you seek to minimize some free energy, which depends on the temperature theta, and the deformation y and its elasticity. So you, you integrate over omega some free energy density, and the important thing is that it depends on this gradient of y with respect to x, and of course the temperature. And you'd like to, to look for a deformation y that minimizes this total energy subject, well, um, among, first of all, invertible y, that's to that, that's a very important issue in elasticity, but I won't talk about it today. To avoid interpenetration of matter, you need that the map is invertible, subject to some boundary conditions. For example, that on some part of the boundary, say d omega 1, you specify exactly where every point goes to. And omega has some, is a bounded uh, region in, 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 in R3 with some reasonable reasonably smooth boundary. And uh, the, uh, the free energy density, of course, is defined for... for um, matrices A, and we, we, we want them to have positive determinants so that the uh, deformed configuration is not reflected with respect to the undeformed uh, configuration. Now, how do you translate the, the phase transformation into um, properties of this energy density of C? Well, one, might, one thing you can do to simplify matters is, is to look at the set of matrices that minimize the free energy density at temperature theta. So that's a, a set K theta. And this is how one might um, uh, uh, assume that, that, how we do assume that, that K theta varies with theta. So look first of all at the middle line where, where theta is equal to the critical temperature. There we want the the high temperature phase and the low temperature phase to have the same energy, right? So now we take as the reference configuration the undistorted cubic phase at the critical temperature, and so that means that y of x equals x should be a minimizer. So that's the gradient of the identity map is the identity matrix, so you want the identity to be uh, a minimizer at theta critical. And SO3, that's the set of rotations, and the energy has to be rotationally invariant. So if the identity is a minimizer. If you just rotate everything rigidly, that has to be a minimizer as well. So SO3 here then is the energy well corresponding to the high temperature phase at, at, at the critical temperature. And now we have the different M, the M different variants of the martensite, each of which is described by a positive definite symmetric matrix UI that depends on temperature. Here it's evaluated at theta critical. Uh, all these uh, um, uh, matrices are, 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 are conjugate to each other by, 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 by rotations in, the, in the, what's called the point group of the, of, the, of, of the high temperature phase. And the SO3, that's rotational invariance again. So above theta critical, you want SO3, or this, this, this factor here is just for thermal expansion to minimize the energy. And below theta critical, you want the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the martensite the different variants of martensite to minimize the energy. So, for example, for cubic to tetragonal, M would be 3, and the three matrices would be uh, diagonal eta 2, eta 1, eta 1, and then you put the eta 2 in the other two places with these two uh, deformation parameters, eta 1 and eta 2, depending on the temperature. Okay, now, so, so, that, so that means, uh, let's go back, um, so, so we have these energy wells, and, and we have the Hadamard jump condition, which says that interfaces correspond to rank one connections between energy wells. So that means that we should look and see uh, uh, when there are uh, rank one connections between these different energy wells, and they're all of the form SO3 times something. So, so there's this bit of linear algebra so if you take two matrices, positive definite symmetric matrices U and V, then SO3 and SOV are rank one connected. That is, you can find a matrix on SO3 and a matrix on SO3U SO3 and a matrix on SO3V whose difference is a matrix of rank one. If and only if 
u squared minus v squared has the form of a non-zero constant times n tensor n tilde plus n tilde tensor n for unit vectors n and n tilde. And if those two vectors are not parallel, then there are exactly two rank one connections between any matrix on one of these wells and the other well. So say between V and SO3U. And they're given like this, RU minus V is A tensor N and R tilde U minus V is A tilde tensor N tilde. And the N and the N tilde are exactly the N and the N tilde in this representation. Okay, so this is a version of some standard uh, result which is due to, to, to many people. So let's read off some, some consequences for that. So first of all, uh, there are no rank one connections between matrices belonging to the same energy well. And that's because, in this case, u is v, and so u squared minus v squared is zero, but the c had to be non-zero. Okay, so. And then, suppose you take two distinct Martin-Zittig variants. Then, um, if, you, if you read off what the, what the theorem tells you, you find that they're rank one connected if and only if the determinant of ui theta squared minus uj theta squared is zero. And then the possible interface normals are orthogonal. So that, so that you get the orthogonality comes because simply um, the, the, trace, the trace of this matrix is, is, is zero because the u and the v are orthogonally related. Okay, so, uh, and that, so, so variance, so typically you will get such um, interfaces uh, and, and variants separated by such interfaces are called twins. And, we'll, and we saw twins in the cubic tetrahedral case in the high in the, in the high resolution electron micrograph. Now here's a very interesting point that if you look at the theorem and, and work out what it says exactly, you find that there's a rank one connection between SO3, that's the high temperature uh, phase uh, energy well, and and SO3 UI, if and only if the middle eigenvalue of UI at the critical temperature is one. Okay, so this is this follows. If you work it out, you find that that's what the theorem tells you. And um, so we'll come back to this because it's it's a really interesting uh, and recent story. Okay, so now here we have our sort of two energy wells, SO three UI, just schematically drawn as circles. So now if you have a twin, that means that you've got a point on one of the wells and the point on the other one, which is connected by a matrix, matrix of rank one. So this red line is, a, is in the direction of a matrix of rank one, and it cuts this energy well at this point, and, and the other energy well at this point, it doesn't cut it anywhere else. And uh, so that means that the energy is zero at these two points, and is positive elsewhere, so it's clear that the, the function is not a convex function in the direction of this matrix of rank one. So, uh, so that means that the energy density is not rank one convex. It's not uh, convex in the direction of matrices of rank one. Now, there's another condition, quasi-convexity, that I'll tell you in a second, which implies rank one convexity. And so if this is not um, rank one convex, it's not quasi-convex either. And this is the definition, so, um, which is very difficult to understand the first time you see it and even the hundredth time you see it. Uh, uh, so um, a, 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 an integrand f is quasi-convex if when you integrate f of the gradient of u over omega, subject to u on the boundary being linear, u of x is ax, then a minimizer is u of x identically equal to ax, in which case this is just, of course, the measure, the n-dimensional volume of omega uh, times f of a. So this is... This is a definition for arbitrary dimensions, of course, in, in, in elasticity, both dimensions are three. So this is a kind of Jensen's inequality for, um, for, for gradients. And, um, and the fact is that this is the central convexity condition of the multidimensional calculus of variations and is, roughly speaking, uh, necessary and sufficient for the existence of uh, minimizers. Uh, so... If it's necessary and sufficient for the existence of minimizers, just lying a little bit, uh, that means that we don't expect, since, since the energy density is not quasi-convex, we don't expect minimizers to exist in general. And that's the case. 
And in general, the gradients of a minimizing sequence will generate an infinitely fine microstructure in the limit j goes to infinity. Now, of course, what we saw here was not infinitely fine, but it is extremely fine at the macroscopic level. And, and uh, the reason that the, mic the microstructures that are observed are not infinitely fine is because there's some interfacial energy corresponding to these interfaces where the atomic environment is a bit different from uh, so a, a, an atom which is in the middle of one of the faces. And that's ignored in the elasticity theory model. So how can you define, how can you describe mathematically infinitely fine microstructures? Because that's a kind of useful idealization. And we use something called gradient young measures, so I briefly explain what these are. So suppose that you're given a sequence of gradients, dyj, uh, so j is equal to 1, 2, and 3, and so, so, so forth. And we fix j, and we fix a point x, and we fix a small uh, radius delta. And we behave like a microscopist. We look in, in this delta neighborhood of the point x, and... Uh, we, we take a point at ra Z at random from this bill, and we look and see what the gradient of YJ of Z, of, of, of gradient of YJ of Z is. And so that way we get a probability uh, distribution uh, mu that depends on, on X, J, and delta, which is the, the, the measure of the, of the, so the volume of the, uh, the point Z for which well, this acting on, on, a, on a subset E of matrices is going to be the, the, the measure of the set of points Z for which dyj of Z is in E divided by the measure of the bool. And then you, um, you let J go to infinity. So imagine that this, this, this sequence is oscillating on smaller and smaller length scales. So that sort of smears out the oscillations. And then you localize it by letting delta go to zero and then hopefully, and there's a theorem that sort of justifies this, that at some level uh, you get, you get an, a probability distribution on matrices that depends only on X. And that's the gradient young measure generated by the sequence dyj, or more precisely, a subsequence of the, of the um, uh, sequence gra gra gradient, y, uh, gradient of yj. And the center of mass of this probability measure is the macroscopic deformation gradient. It's what you see if you uh, look at a larger length scale uh, than, the, than the, the mesoscopic one of those um, high-resolution pictures. And another way of saying it is that it's the weak limit of this sequence, um, dyj. OK. So now, it turns out to be uh, useful to uh, consider um, certain semi-convex hulls. So I want to describe this. This is, is a little technical. Now, there's a, there are various other, because quasi-convexity is not actually understood, and we don't know how to, to, to determine whether a particular function is quasi-convex or not, there are other uh, convexity conditions that are used. And one is polyconvexity. So um, uh, a function of a matrix A is polyconvex. If you can write it, as a convex function of the list of all minors, that's subdeterminants, of the matrix A. Now, suppose you've got uh, a convex cone of continuous functions, which contains constants. So it might be quasi-convex functions, or polyconvex functions, or convex functions. Then for a compact subset of matrices, there's a definition due to Schwerach, of the of the um, of the corresponding hull uh, with uh, of K with respect to these this convex cone, it's the set of A such that a C of A is less than the max of a C over this convex set for all of C in this convex cone of continuous functions. And there's an alternative characterization uh, which you can find in a in a paper of Krucik, which is a very good paper actually. The, but the statement is not quite right in the paper, but it's a very interesting paper. And it, and, it, um, and it makes a connection with the Schocke theory of function cones. And so there's another characterization which says that it's the set of matrices such that there's some probability measure supported on K with G of A less than or equal to um, mu of G for all G in this convex cone of functions. 
And so now when, when we take G to be convex functions or polyconvex functions or quasi-convex functions, then we write KG as KC for convex or KPC for polyconvex or KQC for quasi-convex. And then we find that KQC is the smallest of those sets. It's, it's contained in KPC, which is contained in KC. Okay. Uh, now, so back to maybe less technical things. So, now, when, when a new phase is nucleated uh, in, in such a, a transformation, it has to fit geometrically onto the parent phase. So that's a, both a very important ingredient for, for um, determining the microstructure and morphology that you see, and also, uh, when the two phases are incompatible, it leads to uh, um, uh, metastability. So, for example, here's, uh, here's how usually uh, a material transforms from the high temperature phase here, where the gradient is a constant, to the low temperature phase. Here's the low temperature phase. Now, you see that it does it by means of a, of a laminate. Now, now, remember that there's no rank one connection, typically, between uh, this phase and, and, and one of the energy wells. So, it's impossible for geometrically to have a constant gradient of the low temperature phase here that matches onto the high temperature phase, unless the middle eigenvalue is one, which we see uh, what happens later. So instead it does the next uh, simplest thing. It forms this laminate, fine laminate, and um, so it looks like this, if you like, uh, of two variants, uh, two twins. So these are, these, these are possible interfaces between two twins. Of, and, and so over here we have dyj, say, being the identity. Here it's, it's alternating between A and B, the A layers having thickness lambda over J, the B layers having thickness 1 minus lambda over J. Of course, you can't carry these things right up to the interface because they're not compatible. So there has to be some kind of boundary layer here. And uh, so in terms of gradient young measures, you'd have the Dirac mass at the identity over here, so probability 1 of seeing the identity matrix, 0 of seeing any other matrix. And down here, you have a probability lambda of seeing A and 1 minus lambda of seeing B. And uh, when, you, when you work out whether this is possible, you find that you get uh, some famous formulae uh, from material science of the crystallographic theory of Martensite. Okay, but why should um, the martensitic microstructure be a simple laminate? Why not something more complicated? For example, maybe it should look like this. Why not? So we, we investigated many years ago that situation, and the calculation reduces to this. You, you ask whether you can have, if you work in terms of the macroscopic deformation gradient, you ask whether it's possible to have a, a, a gradient, which is the identity, on one side of this plane with normal n, and on the other, on the other side, uh, it, it belongs to the quasi-convexification of the martensitic energy wells. It turns out that this is what you have to do to check, and then, you, then of course, you need that the f, uh, this f, the macroscopic gradient over here, is equal to the identity plus some vector tensor m. That's the usual Hadamard jump condition. And so this was here. We're, in, we're we're assuming that the that the microstructure over here is homogeneous. So in other words, it's it's this, when you when you when you make it finer and finer, it looks the same um, everywhere. Well, uh, I asked various experimentalists whether they'd ever seen such uh, things, and they said, well, they were, they had better things to do with their time. Uh, so it, well, this, this is how you would do this with um, young measures. So it would be the direct mass of the identity over here. And here you need it to be independent of x on this side and supported in this set of, um, this set of uh, martensitic energy wells. But eventually, there was a European project. We have our little problems with Europe in Britain at the moment. Um, but um, I want to say something for about European projects. This, this was really a great, a great scientific uh, project. And um, there was, um, oh, I should have also said that this, this is a tricky calculation because we don't know what this set is unless you have just two energy wells. Though we did manage to actually say something when M was three. So on this European project was a brilliant experimentalist, Hannes Scheiner from Prague. And he managed to produce one of these uh, 
uh, interfaces with, uh, with, a, with a really brilliant idea, which I don't have time to explain. Uh, and uh, so here's a, an even better picture of one. So here we see a double laminate over here. So there's this interface. And here it's um, the, this is the high temperature phase over this side. Now, I want to show you another fantastic experiment of um, Hannah Schreiner, um, which indicates, I think, very well um, how important compatibility is uh, for martensitic phase transformation. So here he's got a single crystal of copper, aluminum, nickel, which, is, which he managed by, by pulling on it in various ways to, to have a constant gradient in one of the martensitic variants. Okay? So the gradient here is constant, sitting on one of the martensitic energy wells. And this, this you see, is, is quite a small thing. It's 11, 11 millimeters long. It's sitting on some, some gel, which doesn't sort of you know, affect what, what, what happens. And this thing here is the end of a soldering iron, okay? which is very hot, of course. And so um, underneath the, sol the tip of the soldering iron, of course, the temperature is much higher than the, um, the critical temperature. And so you would expect that the, um, that the high temperature phase would nucleate under the tip of the soldering iron, okay? But that's not what happens. I'm going to show you a movie, but I, I show you first stills from the movie so you can, you can see what happens, okay? So here's what actually happens. It nucleates at a corner, okay? And then it propagates across the, the thing, okay? So now I show you the movie. So watch the bottom right-hand corner. Now, why, why is that? Well, it's because, you see, you can't, the high temperature phase is incompatible with the low temperature phase. So you can't match it here, or in the interior, of course, but you can't touch the interior with a soldering iron, or, or on an edge. But at a corner, it is compatible. So what happens is, actually, that it waits until the temperature at the corner is hot enough for the high temperature phase to be nucleated there. Okay, now there are other complex interfaces that you see in martensitic phase transformations. This is copper zinc aluminum, uh, a picture of Morin, Mora, I guess, French. And these are all pictures of copper aluminum nickel uh, from uh, uh, Dick James's group and Chumar True. So you, so you see, I, I'll, in yellow, I'll, I'll sort of try and draw some. Uh, interfaces. Well, you could put an interface almost anywhere in this picture. And actually, that's an attitude that I'm going to take in, in the mathematics. Now, in the, here you could, this is obviously an intro, this is all martensite, so this is a, an interesting microstructure of martensite meeting a, another microstructure of martensite. And here we see down here some kind of fractal, fractal um, boundaries, and also here a, a, a beautiful fractal kind of boundary. Okay, so, um, so that's a, ge a general question then, uh, how are the gradients or gradient young measures on either side of an interface related? And so we saw that the, the simple um, um, uh, hadamard drum condition, uh, we saw that in, in that simple case they had to be rank one related. But more generally, what uh, can we say? And I think it's clear the sort of knowledge of this could, in principle, help to understand our microstructure morphology. OK, so here's a kind of abstract definition of the limiting set of gradients uh, for a Lipschitz map. So a Lipschitz map is one for which the gradient is, is bounded. So let's take an open subset of Rn and uh, a locally Lipschitz map. So Lip Lipschitz uh, locally, then. And we'll take a point A, and we'll take a direction N. So here's the point A, and here's the direction N. And um, so now, since it's locally Lipschitz, that means that if I take delta small enough, uh, this map will be in W1 infinity of this ball BA delta. All right, so 
Now, what I'm going to do is to blow this up around A onto the unit B here through the transformation Zj of x is 1 over delta j uh, of y of a plus delta j x minus y of a, where delta j is smaller than delta and is going to 0 as delta j goes to 0. And of course, what, what the, this one of the things about this is that you get Zj of 0, of course, is 0. And the gradient of Zj is, well, the delta j's cancel, you see. So you, it's, they're, they're the same. The, the gradients of Zj on the, this unit ball are the same values as y has, as the gradient of y has in this ball, except that they're shifted by this, by this scale, scaling. Okay. All right, now, so here's a definition. It's a little bit tricky to explain, maybe, but um, so this, so D, so let's take, the, there's a plus and a minus sign. So this is supposed to be the limiting set of gradients at A on the positive side, so plus N, or on the negative side, minus N. So it's the set of matrices such that there's a sequence delta J going to zero such that for all epsilon, the limit of the, of the measure of the set of points in the unit ball, so B plus, so let's go back to, uh, so the unit ball B is divided into two pieces, B plus and B minus, according to this direction N, okay? So now um, it's the set of points such that for all epsilon bigger than zero, the measure of the set of points in B plus, if you take the plus sign, or B minus, if you take the minus sign, of the gradient of y at A plus delta J x belongs to the bool centered A of radius epsilon. Okay, so roughly speaking, this is, is telling you um, the, 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 the limiting set of values um, at very close to the point A uh, above a plane, say, that passes through A uh, with normal n. So there are different, several different ways of defining this. Another way is to, uh, is to um, look at the supports of young measures on, on the unit ball generated by the, the gradient of, of yj. Now, it turns out that this set need not be closed, and there's a very tricky counterexample in one dimension uh, where you find that uh, the, the, this set d plus 1 y at 0 is just the set of points 1 over k, for k equals 1, 2, and so on, but not 0. Okay. However, the closure of this set has a slightly simpler characterization where the quantifiers, the epsons and the deltas, are in certain in, in different places. Okay, so the closure is the set of points such that for all epsilon, the limit as delta goes to zero of this set is is positive. I guess it's not terribly important. Of course, it is important for the mathematics, but it's not terribly important for this talk. What the exact definition is? Of course, it in the case of a piecewise affine function, it will or or, or, or function that that uh, is piecewise C1, it will give the, 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 the previous uh, result. And, and you, can do, you can rephrase it in terms of interfaces passing through the point A with normal N. You can give similar definitions for microstructures. I don't, I don't give these. Now, there's, a, there's another kind of uh, set of gradients that one might uh, think about. Um, so for an open E in Rn, you can define this, the set of essential gradients to be dy of e is the intersection of all the closed sets such that dy of x belongs to the closed set for almost every x in e. And that's a, so now you could, you might think that this set is the intersection of dy of a plus epsilon b plus minus over all epsilon um, less than delta. But in general, the inclusion is strict. So, there's a, so in, in one dimension, you could, for example, take this function, so here's a step function with slopes 1 and minus 1, and you locate it at points 1 over j, and you scale it with 2 to the j and 2 to the minus j. So you see that the right-hand side um, will, will always contain 0 and plus or minus 1, but in the, in the, in, in the limit, if you like, uh, when, you, when you do the previous definition, these kind of disappear, and so you only you only end up with zero. So in this case, the the left hand side is is smaller than the than the right hand side. Okay. All right. Now, generalized Hadamard conditions as advertised. 
So we take, first of all, an interface problem on a half ball. So we take a half ball, as before, B plus, omega is B plus, and it's flat boundary portion, gamma, the, where x dot n is zero. And we suppose that we've got a Lipschitz map which satisfies the boundary condition y is equal to ax on gamma, where a is a, is a given matrix. So how is a related to the gradients that y takes in omega? So does there, for example, for example exist a, a b in Rm such that a plus b tensor n belongs to dy of omega? And the answer is no, and you can find counterexamples among maps taking just uh, finitely many values. Uh, well, none of, none of the matrices is of the form A plus B tensor N. So it looks more, like, more or less like this, kind of fractals. So each color, there's a constant gradient. Uh, they map a uh, linear map down here, but none of them differ from that linear map by a matrix of, of rank one. And there's some recent work of my student, Francesco Della Porta, who describes a situation relevant to low hysteresis materials, which I'm going to talk about at the end, where such a result is generically true. So in some sense, you imagine taking an, an, a horizontal interface and moving it upwards. Generically, you get sort of good rank one connections, but it's just at the bottom that you don't. Okay. So, Okay, in any case, we, we continue now. So here's the first result, which is a little bit impenetrable. It uses all these quantities that I've described. So, at, and, and, and the good thing about this is that it's um, true in any dimension. So at every point A, and for any direction N, and any locally Lipschitz Y, zero belongs to the difference of these two sets. So the first set is you take the the, the limiting set of gradients from above, you act on identity minus n tensor n, and you take the quasi-convexification. And then the other one, you do the same on the other side with dy minus n of a. So now, so the, this is uh, actually a sort of simple thing to prove in, in some sense. You, 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 um, you can sit, first consider the case of y defined on a half ball with, which is linear on the, on, the, on the boundary as before, and then you take weak limits of the maps y of uh, x prime zj. So x, this is x1 up to xn minus 1, and zj, and you let zj go to 0. And they, that, that will have to converge weakly to, uh, to um, ax on the boundary, and then you reduce the general case to this one by doing a second uh, blow-up. So now, why is this a generalization of the Hadamard jump condition? Well, a corollary is that there is a B such that B tensor N belongs to the difference of the two convex hulls. Okay, so in the piecewise affine case, of course, this would just have been A, and this would just be B. So you'd have B, B tensor N is A minus B. Why, why does this follow from here? Because well, that's easy to see, you see. Um, the, the, the convex hull is bigger than the quasi-convex hull. So the, this certainly tells you that, it's, uh, that zero belongs to the difference of the convex hulls. But for convex hulls, you can take this matrix identity minus n tensor n outside. And then you immediately get this, this statement. Okay. Uh, here's a... We have, we have various kind of weird results connected with this. So here's one I, I just, as a sample, where, which is a generalization of the previous result, where now you don't suppose that this is a half space, but uh, it's, it's essentially anything except there's a bill outside it, uh, which touches uh, the, the, set, the boundary at a point A where the, where the normal to the bill is N, okay? And now you have that in the intersection of some little bill around A, the, the, the map is linear, so y is ax. And again, you get the conclusion that a plus b tensor n belongs to the convex hull of the set of gradients in here. This is, this is kind of a weird, weird result, and it's also quite difficult to prove. It, it, it involves sort of exponential estimates connected with the divergence operator. Okay. Now, our first result many, many years ago uh, um, was this, that when both dimensions are two, then uh, you, you, there exists a B tensor N that belongs to the difference of the 
polyconvex hulls of the sets D minus N of A and D plus N Y of A. So the polyconvex hulls are smaller. So this is a, uh, um, they're smaller than the convex hulls. So this is a better result than for the convex hulls. And it's, 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 uh, it's, um, it's, okay. So anyway, this, this is, this is, this is true. This is, this is a true result, and it, and, it, and it uses results on so-called quasi-regular maps. And we know that uh, when uh, this is true for, this is n equals n equals 2, and we know that this is a false for n bigger equal uh, to 3, with some kind of fractal counterexample. OK, so now, could one use these jump conditions somehow? And so I want to show a sort of uh, some application to polycrystals so uh, a polycrystal, uh, uh, the, the material um, um, crystallizes in grains in each of which the, the crystal axes are the same. But in a neighboring grain, the crystal axes would be rotated. And so you get uh, interesting microstructures here, which, um, so here's uh, one grain. This is uh, in barium titanate, a ceramic. This is a very nice paper of Alt. And, and you see, what's interesting is that you see that the microstructures in one grain seem to affect the microstructures in the next grain. Okay? And that's very understandable. Probably what happens is that one of these grains, uh, the, the low temperature phase, nucleates first, and then it de de deforms the boundary a bit. And then when the next grain transforms, it sees that deformation of the boundary and that it affects the microstructure that you, that you get that. So could one say anything about that. So I'm going to show you, uh, so look, we make um, terribly strong hypotheses and we get a very weak conclusion, but nevertheless, uh, uh, we, and, we, uh, and, and also we have to work very hard as well. So this is maybe typical of mathematics, uh, but anyway, here, here we go. So we have a, a zero energy microstructure for a bicrystal. So first of all, it's a bicrystal, not a polycrystal. It just has two grains, all right? And secondly, the, the grains have a particular form they are, they are, there's a vertical interface between them, okay? So uh, I hope you see, so omega-1 is on the left-hand side of this interface, and omega-2 is on the, uh, capital omega-2 is on the right-hand side. And um, so also we're going to assume that just two martensitic energy wells, which we take to be these two uh, corresponding to U1 and U2, so eta-3 is the same in both of them, and then eta-1 and eta-2 are swapped. And so in green 1, this is unrotated axes, and so what you want, so the great omega-1 is little omega-1 crossed with 0d, which is the vertical. And here we want a microstructure whose gradients are supported in the set k, which is these martensitic energy wells. And then the second grain is rotated, the axes are rotated with respect to the first grain about a vertical axis through an angle alpha. Okay, so here, what you want is that the support of the, of the gradient young measure is contained in k r alpha, and r alpha is this rotation which, which has axis, axis E3. Now, it's always possible to have zero energy microstructure with a macroscopic gradient being that corresponding to the, uh, um, the, 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 um, the, the volume change of the uh, transformation, which is a to 1, A to 2, A to 3 to the 1 third, the identity. And actually, there's other, um, there are other deformations that are possible, uh, other microstructures that are possible for any polycrystal, whatever the, whatever the grain. Uh, um, that's an interesting sort of issue, but I don't have time to discuss it. Anyway, here, this asks you a very simple question. Do you have to have a microstructure in every grain? Do you have to have a microstructure in every grain? So, is it true that every zero energy microstructure is non-trivial? In other words, not a pure phase in each of the grains. Okay, so this is what we tried to do. So the first result is that if the interface is planar, so I drew it as kind of curved, but if it was just a plane, then there always is a, an en a, a zero energy microstructure which has a pure phase, so a direct mass at one of the uh, matrices in, in the energy well in one of the grains. So therefore, the interface needs to be curved in order to show that the microstructure has to be non-trivial. And let's write the, the normal to the interface as n, which is cos theta sine theta 0. And so the second result says, well, we specialize it to alpha is pi by 4, so that we can calculate things a bit easier. 
then it's impossible to have a zero energy microstructure with a pure phase in one of the grains if the boundary between the grains contains a normal with theta in this blue set and another normal with theta in the red set, okay? And so how's it done? Well, okay, so first of all, you reduce it to two dimensions. Then you use the characterization of the quasi-convex hull, which equals their polyconvex hull. And now the interesting thing is that you use this generalized jump condition to show that there's a rank one connection between the polyconvex hulls, and then you do horrendous calculations. And they, are, they appear finally in this, in this paper here. Okay, so now to end with, I want to show you some really interesting stuff. Um, uh, now, so remember that I, I, I said that the, um, that the condition that um, there's no rank one that there is a rank one connection between the austenite energy well and the martensite energy well is that the middle eigenvalue of the transformation strain is one. Okay, now, if you're a mathematician like me, you say, well, the middle eigenvalue of the transformation strain is never going to be one, right? So it's not a very interesting case to consider. But my co-worker, Dick James, and in fact, these, these calculations came from a paper that we, we wrote together many years ago, but he had a much more faith in mathematics somehow. And he said, well, let's make a material for which the middle eigenvalue is one. And what's more, he made a material for which not only the middle eigenvalue is one, but certain other conditions hold, which form what are called, called the cofactor conditions. And these, so usually when you do uh, a classical austenite martensite interface with this laminate, then the volume fraction is determined by the calculation. But suppose that any volume fraction is possible. Okay, that's the, so that together with the middle eigenvalue being one form the cofactor conditions. And he, they found a material, so Shen Chen, I don't know whether she, she's here, maybe somewhere, I'm not sure, but he, she, uh, she's in Hong Kong, and, and she's involved with this uh, experiment. And um, so amazing things happen, okay? Amazing things happen. So first of all, um, the, the hysteresis of the transformation gets reduced from about you know, typical values of maybe 70 degrees centigrade to 2 degrees centigrade. Okay. Secondly, uh, you can cycle these materials many times without damaging the material. So in later materials that were found by quant and so on, um, they, the, you can cycle them millions and millions of times without damaging them. Okay. And thirdly, you get the most amazing microstructures, which people have never seen before. So I, I try, and so this is, I'll show you the picture. So, so this is thermal cycling of the material. So that's austenite. This is martensite. And that's austenite. And this is martensite. And the amazing thing is you get a different microstructure every time. Okay. Really extraordinary. And so we try to understand this in particular, my student uh, worked on what's called a moving mask approximation um, for this. And he also identified other conditions on the UI that uh, allow new microstructures closely satisfied in the alloy. So the principle is that if you have very special conditions on the deformation parameters, then new microstructures are possible, which make uh, new pathways possible for the transformation. And that is the general sort of principle. Uh, okay, and now here's another picture of a, of a, of a lambda two equals one alloy. So this is uh, t this is a, a, a polycrystal. So here's one. Of, here's a grain of the polycrystal. This is uh, from uh, Tominari Inamura, who's a material scientist, but he spent um, the whole year in Oxford in the Mathematical Institute because he wanted to learn about subleft spaces. How about that, right? And he does these amazing amazing experiments. And so he, this is a cubic to orthorhombic alloy, titanium, niobium, and aluminum, and, and this middle, middle eigenvalue is one alloy. And this is not a trivial thing to do. This is, this is uh, he, he, he um, nucleates the martensite, and then, then in order to see what's happening, you have to slice the, slice the material with a hot wire. Okay, so this is, goes through the middle of a grain. Of course, that destroys the microstructure on the surface, and then you've got to polish it and all that sort of stuff. And then you have to identify what the deformation gradients are. This is done, done with EBSD. And um, okay, so now the situation is that um, here's the identity. That's the, the, the austenite, the high temperature phase. There are six 
energy roles, uh, cubic to orthorhombic, and because the middle eigenvalue is one, uh, there are exactly two matrices on each of the other wells which are rank one connected to the identity. But none of those matrices are rank one connected to each other. Okay, so I believe that this picture shows an experimental sort of approximation to an exact gradient taking 12 values with no rank one connections between the gradients. And we know that that's theoretically possible for that to happen. Uh, so the, more work is being done to try to really determine whether, whether uh, that's uh, a good way of thinking about things or not. So in the end, I want to, to end, if I go two more minutes or so, um, I wanted to show you something completely different, but which is related to all this. So this is all very well, this kind of theory that I, I've tried to describe, but it's static, there's no dynamics, and it's not predictive. And, and actually, you know, we're, we're incapable of really doing this properly with dynamic equations. We don't have any dynamic equations which, for which we know that there are solutions, for example. And even if we did, it would be, at the moment, uh, impossibly difficult. So it is interesting to have kind of intermediate theories that, um, that retain a bit of the important thing, which is compatibility. And, uh, and it may enable you to see something interesting. So this is such a proposal. And um, so now, what we, the experiments, particularly done in Barcelona, where uh, you, 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 you measure acoustic emissions that come from a, um, uh, a martensitic phase transformation. So, and you get a kind of power laws for the, um, for the energies of such emissions. So, so the, this is a caricature of what we think might happen. So in, in its very simplest caricature, you take a square, okay, and then you take a point at random from the square, where we're going to nucleate a martensitic plate. And in this caricature, you're allowed to, to either have a vertical plate or a horizontal plate with probability a half. So here we, we take a horizontal plate with probability a half. Let me take another point at random, and we nucleate another plate there. So again, we're only allowed two directions, horizontal or vertical. In this case, time, we, we, we go vertical. But now you're not allowed to go any further than the plate that you've already nucleated. Okay? And then you continue like this, right? You go on like this, and then you ask what happens. And if you, with two directions, you get pictures like this. With uh, four directions, you get pictures like this, which are not so not so different from what you see in some of these pictures, actually. And, um, and so, uh, so this is my model, actually, but uh, Pierre Luigi Cesano and Ben Hammond. Ben Hammond is a probabilist in Oxford, and he's a specialist on what are called branching random walks. And um, he put this into a branching random walk. And then you can sort of predict approximate power laws for the plate lengths, which, which one can try to relate, and to some extent one relates to the observations for acoustic emissions. So I think this, and, and so actually, in, in this picture of, just going, going back, sorry, um, going back to Tominari's lovely picture here, there are power laws here as well. If you, if you, if you look at the, the, um, the histogram of the, of the lengths of these intersections of the plates with this two-dimensional plane, they go like the length of the plate to the minus 2.6, for example. Okay, so so it's very it's a, there are very similar things for the for the for the uh, plate lengths in these other pictures. So I think this is a very exciting sort of time to try and understand these uh, materials. Of course, uh, another exciting thing would be whether one can use them for something. Uh, at the moment, of course, gold is a bit expensive, so maybe you need to find uh, cheaper materials. Okay, so I stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Bo, for this uh, very inspiring talk. And uh, I think in the audience there are some metallurgists, some are very expert with uh, mountain site transformation. So let's start. <laughs> yeah. So. The case you showed where you were cycling the Martin yes, site, Martinites, yeah. Austinite, you keep getting new microstructures yeah. each time. Is there some statement you can make about the uniqueness of the microstructure? Is that a special case for just lambda, for that middle eigenvalue being one, that you have this lack of uniqueness? Or is that a general result? Well, uh, 
you don't have any general result like that. Of course, I mean, one of the things one would like to understand is what, I mean, it shows in this picture that it's fantastically unstable, right? That, that you, a little change in the way the nucleate sends things off in a completely different direction. So, of course, what's, what's interesting, I suppose it's the same for the climate, is what is it that you can predict about the, <laughs> about the microstructure? Right. And, and so this is something, I mean, there's, there's not really been enough careful experiments to, to yet to, 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 to really say something, I think. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, let's see. As I understand, right, for the modern site, involve, involve move of like a carbon induced modern site. So the carbon goes to different orientation, giving you tetragonal distortion. Okay. How carbon diffusion affects the microstructure here? Okay, so in these, I mean, typically modern city transformations are, are thought to have little or no diffusion. So there's essentially no diffusion here, of course, but... Um. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Sally. Yeah. It's a more mathematical question. Uh, at some point at the beginning, when you, you define K of theta, you say assume. Yes. So this assumption comes from you just want to prove something specific, or is it... Yes, it's, it's, it, it, it's a phenomenological okay. theory, if you like, of course, that raises the question of how you get the energy function from, you know, some first principles calculations, you know, with the interactions between the atoms and electrons and so on. Of course, people try to try to do this, but but it's essentially just a phenomenological assumption to correspond to what we see in the phase transformation. Yeah, please. The modern cytic transformation is this, uh, basically is this. Uh, diffusionless, but when you do the thermocycling experiment, uh, definitely atom going to move, the diffusion going to get involved. So the, the microstructure, how... how well, the atoms are moving, but that's not, not diffusion, I would say. I mean, of course, the, 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 the deformation gradient everywhere is changing with, with, with time. But the but temperature, still, temperature going to make it move. Uh, well, it's certainly, you're going to move, move. So when you when you cool it down, when you do recycling again, of course, I I don't expect that the microstructure can discover. It's an irreversible process. It's not reversible. This is rever this is highly reversible. Well, I mean, the because because well, you get different microstructures each time, job. but in some sense, it's highly re reversible, and that's the fact that the you can cycle these materials materials millions of times without damage shows that, in fact, there can be very little diffusion, I would say. Okay, because I, I am not an experimentalist. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, probably the last year. Yeah. This is totally above my head. But <laughs> <laughs> um, these cycling structures, this is, a, is that an exploration of a diversity of states of same free energy? Yes, it's a very complicated energy landscape, presumably. Yeah, but it's of, yeah, the, yeah. the states must be very, very similar. Very, in the very energy. similar. Exactly. And so exactly. it's just a random, it depending very much on the experiment also, where That's you right. fall into a small yes. well yes. rather than another one. Yes, I completely agree, yes. That's okay, right. the second question is how do you get to a composition like titanium-76, niobium-22, aluminium-2? How do people find that? Well, I, I, I'm not, okay, so um, <laughs> one, one, one can say that these are materials discovered by mathematics, and, 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 and to some extent that's correct, because one knows what the, the relationships between the deformation parameters that one wants are, okay? But then, of course, you have to change the composition to get the deformation parameters satisfying what you want, right? So I guess to start with, they did it kind of um, by guesswork and seeing what you know uh, what was what was working, what was not working. But then there were it wasn't just mathematics; it was there were also combinatorial chemists. So these, That's as I understand exactly it, the people who can do let's say part, yeah. can can do. So when, uh -huh. when you get very close, then you can optimize by by doing this combinatorial chemistry, where you're doing experiments with with many different compositions at the same time. The last comment is about the dynamics because there must be a rate dependence when you when it heats up or when it when you heat it up or let it cool down. 
it must very, very strongly depend also on the dynamics, uh, how fast it heated. Well, in, at least in, I, 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 I would hesitate to comment on this particular experiment, but in some other experiments where you're cycling with, with loads, um, I, I believe it's more or less rate independent. But um, anyway, we, we, could, we could discuss this, but yeah. Other question? Yeah. <laughs> David? Yes. If you only if you only have, for example, three different domains, then the limits the kind of junctions you can have between these domain walls. Between Are you talking about the, the grain boundary? No, 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 no. no just, in, just, in, just, just imagine you have a single crystal. Yes, okay. Originally yeah, a single crystal. Yeah, yeah. So you have a certain number of domains which are given by the difference in the symmet by the sim point group symmetries of the individual phases. So if you only have three possible if you only have three possible orientations of the Martin site, does that that means then you can only get junctions of three domains at one along one line, right? So I'm just trying to figure out what the topology if there's any restriction on the topology of the no, junctions. Because you have three variants, but you can rotate them all, of course, and that affects. Yeah, the but you're starting off from yeah, the yeah, same yeah. single crystal, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So is there any restriction given the point group symmetries of the phases and the topologies of the junctions? I, th I think we need to discuss, so I understand exactly what you're saying, but, <laughs> I, I, but, but we, we could discuss it okay. at another time. Okay, yeah. that, uh, yeah, I think uh, we have uh, still a lot of uh, discussion to do. So uh, may, I, may I ask uh, one question? Yeah, last question. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, for the Martin set, you choose the Martin set as a uh, Martin set transformation as an example. So I think probably it's easier to treat the uh, so-called uh, twin in a pure metal. It's easier yeah. to generate uh, this kind of interface because we can easily uh, generate a lot of uh, multi-scale twin. Because Martin side transformation, the problem is, as you know, they are not only the they are also the volume change. Then the volume change can uh, uh, so-called uh, induce uh, the the to change the dynamic of phase transformation. Yes, yes. So then the problem becomes uh, very complex. Because, uh, uh, when we predict, for example, internal stress or residual stress in the ma during the Martin set transformation, we need to do a lot of iteration. Because uh, uh, when you have Martin set transformation, you generate uh, internal stress. The internal stress will change the Martin set yeah, yeah. Uh, transformation dynamics. So uh, probably uh, we can take an uh, easier example, but it's very interesting because from a, a factual mechanics viewpoint, this kind of structure is an ideal case to avoid the so-called uh, uh, strand localization. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, what we try to do, but uh, uh, one day probably we can achieve this because uh, if the, stra uh, the structure is homogeneous, then when you have a crack, then uh, the crack can propagate very easily. But if you have a, a such complex uh, structure, then any crack come from anywhere uh, can be stopped by uh, this kind of structure. Yeah. Well, so it's a very interesting this, uh, work. Okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, the, the director indicated us it's already the uh, coffee break time. So let's go to coffee break first. Thank you. Okay.